Well, welcome to uh, China, the past, present, the future, and why should we care? Uh, presentation will be by uh, Rocky Rowland, who is a retired Air Force Colonel, 27 years in the Air Force, Air Naval War College, uh, spent some time in Washington, D.C., studying Mandarin Chinese, uh, Chinese history and culture, Chinese military capabilities in preparation for a three-year assignment as the Air Force attache in the U.S. Embassy in Beijing, China. So with that, Rocky, can you take it away and uh, bring us up to date on all things China? Sure. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm not sure how questions work uh, in this format, but uh, uh, we'll try to figure it out so everybody can ask questions uh, when they want or as, as we go. Uh, I, you know, I know there's methods inside this to do that. Yeah, uh, um, just a comment on that. The, uh, your microphones will be muted as we go along, but if you press the space bar on your computer, that will temporarily unmute your microphone uh, in order to ask a question. And when you release it, your microphone will go back on mute. So, uh, good point. Thanks, Ron. Yep. Please, please ask questions as we go. We'll try to keep uh, on track here. Uh, try to get done in an hour or a little over. Um, and away we go. Uh, picture of China. We were talking earlier. Uh, I've probably been to every one of these cities shown on this map. A wow. huge place, sparsely populated in some areas and grossly overpopulated uh, in others. The, uh, well, maybe this is going to work. Let's try this. There we go. Uh, there's actually about 31 provinces in China. Interesting thing to note, there's uh, a, a similar number of dialects. Uh, it's not like being Southern or from Boston. Uh, these people cannot understand each other. Uh, one of the big things that happened, uh, we'll talk about later, is when Chairman Mao was in power, is, is he dictated that Mandarin Chinese uh, become the national language. And so now uh, they actually uh, can talk to each other across these provinces, although uh, their local languages still are popular and still uh, are the main language in the provinces. And I can't understand anybody in those provinces. It's a huge place, uh, as big as the United States, all kinds of uh, uh, varying uh, uh, topography and uh, geography, beautiful places. That's the Lee River in the upper left, lots of rice terracing. We're gonna talk about arable land uh, and then, of course, they have huge deserts uh, also. Uh, Great Wall, everybody knows about uh, or has heard of. Uh, probably the most famous uh, artifact in, uh, in, in China. It was built over many hundreds of years uh, and was never breached. Uh, the only time that it, it actually... Uh, uh, was uh, conquered militarily. They had a revolt from the inside and opened the gates, uh, but the wall itself was never, never breached. I'm going to talk a little bit about religion, philosophy, and culture to give us an idea how we get uh, from ancient China down through the years to the philosophy, re religion, and culture, how it impacts them today and us today. Uh, of course, the uh, the architecture uh, has come down through the ages. The first emperor uh, was Chen Shi Huangdi. He's the guy that did the terracotta soldiers in Xi'an. Uh, he was in 222 BC, and that's really the start of formal uh, Chinese history. There's much history before that, but this is the formal thing. This is when there started to actually be something you might call a China. One thing to remember uh, throughout all of this is that the emperor was divine, 
And that never changed even in the current uh, leadership. Okay, something disappeared here. There we go. This is a Temple of Heaven in Beijing. Uh, centuries of emperors all trying to outdo each other in their uh, architecture and their art. Uh, the study of history is preeminent in China. School children study in ex excruciating detail the history and culture of the dynasties. The important thing on this slide is the last entry. Uh, because of this uh, style of leadership over the years, there is absolutely no inherent concept of individual rights in China. It does not exist. Now, you're, you're starting to see the development of some in just in the last 10, 15 years, but uh, historically and culturally, it doesn't exist. There are, uh, is a history of uh, religion uh, throughout the development and, and uh, expansion of China. Most uh, important one is Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism, also important. Uh, the three main factors that uh, inculcate their entire culture and, and down to the current time are these three things on the slide here. Um, that's uh, social consciousness. In other words, they do uh, look out for the good of the many. They are a glass half full culture. They tend to be on the optimistic side and always look for a positive outcome, even when one does not present itself. And then the last one here is, is starting to fade away, but it, it's uh, really still uh, important for modern China, and that's filial piety. And that means, uh, that means the uh, loyalty to your family and your responsibility to take care of your family for their entire life. And also there's a certain amount of this that uh, had to do with uh, ancestor worship. All of those uh, emperors and dynasties ended in 1911, or started at, uh, to end in 1911. And after that, we had a, a period of warlords, revolution, and the development of modern China. And we'll go through that uh, in just a few uh, slides. In 1911, then a famous man in China, Dr. Sun Yat-sen, uh, led a revolt, uh, and he was trying to get the government to be controlled by the people. And it actually happened for a period of time from about 1912 to 1916, there was somewhat of what you might call uh, a democratic style uh, government and leadership in China. But that uh, then devolved almost immediately into a period of the warlords, where the entirety of China, all of those uh, provinces that we saw, every one of them had their own warlord, and they were all fighting each other. There was no central government at all uh, from 1916 uh, to 1928, actually for a longer period than that, than that because... Uh, it, the fighting continued. The Chinese Communist Party actually formed in 1933 during this warlord period. Uh, at the end of the, all of this fighting, the Communist Party was victorious over the other warlords. Uh, they, and in 1949, they gained control of all of China and Chairman Mao was installed as the, as the leader. Uh, his leadership lasted for many years, uh, up until the 70s, and uh, he was characterized by, the, by extreme initiatives, violent changes in the culture. A great leap forward was about producing steel, and they ended up killing uh, almost all the trees in China, and there is an estimate as many as 50 million people died during the great leap forward from starvation. Uh, cultural revolution was the, the war against culture and technology where all the city people were sent to the country, where you had to, everybody had to work on the, on the farms, and it was devastating to the country. Some good things he did is he standardized Mandarin Chinese as the uh, language for uh, China, and they now are able to, to speak and talk to each other across the country. Uh, the characters or the, or the writing is the same for everyone, but the pronunciation is different. Uh, religion was outlawed at this, at this time. Uh, 
Uh, he, he, Chairman Mao, was very mercurial, and he was often deadly. Uh, there were almost continual purges. He would uh, take out anybody around him he thought who might be a challenge to his power. But he did uh, bring uh, them from this time of warlords into the modern age, and he is still in many ways uh, revered in China. Things really started to change in China about 1976. Uh, that's when the leader Deng Xiaoping uh, became the chairman of the Communist Party. And his idea was to let capitalism start to take root and start a, to take form in China. And uh, it, the last of that uh, listing underneath him, he, he developed capitalism with Chinese characteristics. Uh, and that could be another whole hour lecture about how that worked out and, and is still working out inside China. But nonetheless, uh, he did say these things above, to get rich is glorious. And, uh, and it really did, was the start of the uh, end of communism in China. And essentially now, uh, at this time, communism doesn't exist in China at all. Uh, it's gone. Uh, so he is the guy that, that started all this. Uh, at this time also, this is the very beginning of China's move away from isolationism. Up until this time, literally from the time they were first a modern, uh, first a, a, a country back in the oh, early eight, nine hundreds and into the Middle Ages, they did at one time actually have a navy, but they were totally isolationist by their own design and their own desire. Uh, however, when Deng Xiaoping uh, started to come into power, he is, uh, one of his tenets was China had to interact with the world. And so it's at, it's at this time that China finally started uh, to have relations, trade relations, political relations with the rest of the world. Uh, a big uh, fallback in their, uh, in their ability to integrate with the rest of the world happened in 1989, the Tiananmen Square incident. That little word there after that, Liu Su, that's still, that means June 4th. It doesn't mean June 4th, it, it, it literally means 6-4, Liu Su. But everybody knows when you say that, you're talking about Tiananmen Square. Uh, it was, uh, characterized as a pro-democracy mo movement, but that was not true. Uh, it was a protest against the removal of a very popular pro-reform leader, a capitalist uh, leader in the Central Committee, and, uh, and the rest of the leadership put that down uh, very strongly. And they moved these military units that they moved in, they moved in from provinces more than 300 miles away from Beijing, so there wouldn't be any interaction between local people and the old citizens of Beijing. This did lead to a lot of changes uh, within China. And uh, this phrase at the bottom of the last time, Yua La Yua, means little by little. And uh, China has been changing very dramatically for China, little by little, Yua La Yua. Everybody, of course, has heard about the one-child policy. Uh, it was initiated in 1979 by Deng Xiaoping. Uh, China's population was exploding. They've had a, a continuing problem trying to feed their people. Uh, there are a bunch of misconceptions about that, though, and I want to spend a little bit of time and we'll talk about that just so you know uh, how this actually worked in China. It only applied to Han Chinese in urban areas. If we go back to that second slide we had, uh, there's uh, 37 minorities or 55, or depending on whose uh, documentation you read, and minorities mean not Chinese people. And uh, the Han Chinese make up 93% of the population of China. So this uh, one child policy did not apply to all the other uh, minority members in China. It also did not apply in the rural areas uh, because they needed the population to work in the fields and to work in agriculture. 
Uh, and so they could have uh, up to two ch children. You can get a waiver if your first child's a girl. Uh, under this policy, they are going to hit zero population growth by 2025 uh, in China. Of course, boys are preferred. That's the little emperors that you see here, and that's what they're called uh, inside China. Uh, like most places in China, if you have money, these rules do not apply at all. So if you have any money, there's no such thing as a one-child policy. And enforcement is through a thing called Donways, which the closest thing we have to that is uh, a trade union. Uh, and so that's where the enforcement came, not through the central government. So there's a lot of issues. Like I said, we could probably spend an hour uh, talking about the one child policy. It is still in place, but almost not effective at all now because there is a development of a middle class. People can support their own children they're not getting support from the Donways, and so the one-child policy is just fading, fading away. China's still largely agrarian, even though it has these massive population centers, they're very compact. Uh, <clears throat> when I lived in China in the 90s, late 90s, the disposable income was less than $100 per year. In, in the rural areas. Now it's up to $500 per year disposable income. So rural China is still massively poor. Uh, China has 20% of the world's population and only 7% of the world's arable land or uh, land that you can grow crops on. And that arrow there after that on the slide means that arable land's going down dramatically every year as they build more cities, more housing, more golf courses. The land that they previously were using to feed the people is going away. So famine is a constant threat in China. Uh, it's a real problem because if they have a really bad year, there will be somewhere between 50 and 100 million people that will die. And there's not anything anybody can do about it because there's, it's a law of large numbers. There's so many people in the country that it's impossible. The whole world does not have enough transportation to move enough food to feed them. So it's a real worry for leadership, famine uh, inside China, because revolts always come in time of famine. The government is always overthrown uh, in a time of famine. That's the history of China. Of course, we're all familiar with the Chinese factory uh, ideas and I guess I would say propaganda in a way. Uh, their factory working conditions versus the West are dramatically different than what we would see uh, here. But versus the whole rest of China, they're dramatically different as far as in high tech and in advanced technology. There was a massive employment migration from the rural areas to the cities uh, in order to try to get jobs in these factories. Uh, until two years ago in China, they had what were called hukos or internal passports. You were not allowed to travel inside China at all uh, unless you had permission of your trade union. And you had to have your passport stamped going and coming to go to another city. Uh, what happened starting in the late 70s and early 80s is these rural farmers started illegally migrating to the cities to work in construction in the factories. In these factories you see here, these workers can make more in a year than they would make in 10 years in their home states, their home uh, agrarian areas. So there's massive demand for these jobs. Uh, there's no, except in a few areas, uh, we're talking like Xinjiang, where there are they're cracking down on the Uyghur population. There is, are some slave, what you would call slave labor or enforced labor camps in those areas. But these are all volunteers and really, really happy uh, to be there and have this job. More law of large numbers. China has 120 cities, more than a million. We've got 10 in the US, uh, maybe 12 now, but uh, there's 120. Uh, their vertical development's mandatory because they don't have any land. Uh, 
to do that. So they have to develop going up. And uh, this is an example, this city of Shenzhen, which is down near Hong Kong, it was developed as an economic center from a plan, from scratch. There was nothing there. There were 30,000 people in the area of Shenzhen in 1980, and there are 10 million people there now. That's how the modernization of China has, has worked in the development and industrialization. Universities are massively competitive. They do national testing, and you are ranked from one to 400,000. In other words, every single person in the, in the nation that tests is ranked in order. And then you, you get uh, assigned to a university based on your rank. And so the top universities have the very top students. Uh, there's a historical, very high reverence for scholars. And so scholarship is still extremely important in China. Uh, another adjunct to that at the bottom is the elite or the princes and princesses, the uh, sons and daughters of the ruling elite uh, almost always study abroad, uh, many of them uh, in the United States. Uh, interesting to note now, at this time, China's youth has uh, no experience at all with communist China. They have no experience at all with communism. They, they don't know anything about Mao except what they read in the history books. Uh, so the ideas and the nature of China interior now is totally different than it was uh, Mao and his uh, cronies would not recognize the modern China at all. Uh, no resemblance. Technology rules China. It's king. So uh, everybody studies technology. Filial uh, piety is out. Uh, and so for the first time ever now, China has to come up with a way to take care of their aging population. There were no such things at all when I lived there as retirement homes, nursing homes, assisted living facilities. They did not exist. The family took care of everything. That's changing now because all these young people are moving now all over China and all over the world. And there has to be a whole system developed to, to take care of the, the aging population. So that's how we kind of got from isolation to a world power. Uh, now we'll kind of uh, talk a little bit about what's going on now uh, and uh, some of the perceptions about China and what's gonna happen now and in the future. Uh, a recap here, you see that uh, the first diplomatic uh, contact from us, from the United States with China was in 1972. Uh, and that was a, a very historic meeting between Mao and Nixon and opened up China as far as the United States was concerned. We essentially uh, had missionaries there before that, and that was it as far as uh, contact with China, some scholars, but mostly missionaries. Uh, then the big thing, and we've talked a little bit about this before, was in 1976, Deng Xiaoping uh, begins his transition from communism or communal uh, industries uh, to capitalism and capitalism with Chinese characteristics. And what that essentially boils down to is many of the largest companies uh, formed are still owned by government agencies and they're, they're what is now termed quasi government agencies. They have all the appearances of uh, an independent company, but in many times they're owned or funded by government agencies. And so it's, uh, that's the Chinese character, uh, characteristics uh, that they talked about. Uh, in about 1984, they opened up special economic zones. They started trading much more openly with Hong Kong and became a real factor. They started to build the city of Shenzhen uh, in that time period to interact with Hong Kong. All of, the, all of this time, they kept relaxing controls, relaxing decentralization, giving more power to the provinces. Uh, of course, they've always had a problem, and, and they're not alone in this, is that they have a lot of corruption inside their system, which is even more uh, detrimental when you have a centrally controlled system. 
It's much more difficult to root out. So one of the troubles they've been having and still have is how to root out the corruption uh, in the state controlled agencies. Uh, beginning in, a, in the late 90s, uh, the privatization really started to take over. They still have a certain amount of, of trouble with the state-owned industries uh, that they've not been able to transition. I'll give you one example. Uh, there's a company in uh, Beijing called Baojiang Steel. Baojiang Steel employs, uh, employs 180,000 people in one campus. Uh, they have their own schools, their, their own hospitals, their, their own uh, production facilities. Everything is provided by Baojiang Steel, except they're totally technologically out of date. But China, Beijing cannot afford to close Baojiang Steel because they have nothing to do with those 184, those 180,000 people that are employed there. So they stay open. Uh, producing steel that nobody wants because of the quality because China cannot afford to close them. And there are several other industries like that. It's a real problem uh, China has. Same in agriculture. They can't go to modern agriculture methods because they put all the peasants out of work. Uh, and then that would lead to a revolt. So they're, they're walking a fine line continually on how to make this transition from centralized industries and centralized control to total privatization. Of course, we talked about earlier Tiananmen Square and that dropped them back rapidly. That was a big dip in their uh, modernization. It was in the time period immediately after Tiananmen Square. Uh, the current leader, Xi Jinping, uh, started to come into play about 1997 when he first became a regional party leader. Uh, since then, his rise has been pretty spectacular. Uh, these particular dates are when he moved up the pyramid that's shown on the right. Party Congress at the bottom, there's uh, 2,200 or so delegates. Uh, in 2018, he became the party general secretary, the number one person in the party. So in that length of time, he made that trip from the bottom of that pyramid to the very peak. Uh, China is, a, is really an oligarchy. I mean, uh, he, uh, Xi Jinping has a lot of power, but the seven Politburo members, the ones right below him, those uh, seven, eight people, that's who really controls China. It's really not one person. Uh, it's really that, that group. But he has a lot of power and he's, a, like most countries, he's the face and figure of China. And so this is who people think of or, or uh, realize as the head of China. Now, something that's been going on, there's two or three initiatives and we're gonna talk about them here as we get ourselves right down into the modern time period and, and why all the blowback uh, politically right now against China and why that's happening. And uh, one of those factors that uh, is uh, driving that is this initiative. It's called the Belt and Road Initiative, or sometimes it's called the New Silk Road. And this is uh, a 20 year plan uh, by China to improve their trade relations with everybody around them. And they're doing it by investing money in many, many things, in uh, highways, in ships, in pipelines. They're, they're spending billions and billions of dollars in these foreign countries developing infrastructure. Uh, side note, if you look at the blue line there, which is their China's maritime trade highway that they're trying to develop, we followed almost that exact route on a cruise. We did a 70 day cruise a couple of years ago and we followed almost that exact route and went all the way around Africa. And every port that we stopped in, there were billion dollar projects visible from the ship in the harbors, new uh, commercial harbors, uh, new factories, new warehouses, all, uh, funded and supported by China everywhere along that route. It's, it's unbelievable. 
the influence in the in the uh, uh, the Im impact that they're having on those countries. Uh, how that will play out in the future, nobody is sure whether there's any long-term loyalty that will be established by that, but for sure, they're gonna have guaranteed access in those ports now, uh, because that's part of their contract with those countries, and it would be very hard for those countries now to go back on those agreements. And so that's been a really important thing uh, from their trade policy and their uh, world strategic policy is to, oh, let me go back here, is to, uh, establish those uh, trade routes and particularly those sea uh, routes and harbors at the time. This gives you an idea of the of the countries that they're uh, interacting with uh, and of course you see China in red up there and, and all these other countries in blue. Every one of those countries has a formal either a treaty or a contract agreement with China for trade and infrastructure development. Uh, that's a huge footprint uh, when you look at that. When you look at the amount of money they're spending versus the amount of the money that the United States spends on foreign aid, it's, it's unbelievable uh, what the difference is uh, out there. This chart here in the lower right, the kind of square chart in blue and yellow, gives you an idea in billions of dollars that were invested by the Chinese government in those uh, figures. So South Korea at the top, 2018, 21 billion, 2019, 16 billion. That shows you how important China feels that uh, South Korea is to their future, strategic future. And this goes on and on. Uh, they've probably uh, invested uh, between five and $800 billion since uh, 2013 in this initiative. And they're getting some payback out of it. It's starting to show dividends to them uh, in loyalty and, and in support in uh, international affairs. The second development uh, that happened uh, in 2015, and both of these, one 2014, one 2015, were uh, initiated by Xi Jinping. This is part of his strategic plan. Uh, this one is called Made in China 2025, and this bears a startling resemblance to the old communist 10-year plans uh, because it came out in 2015 and it lasted 10 years and has 10 sectors. And the idea here is uh, with each of those sectors that you see listed on the, the slide, China wants to become a world-renowned manufacturer or supplier of uh, devices and products in every one of those industries, and they are not now. Okay? The only one where they are is information technology. All the rest, they lag, and, and uh, so the idea for them is they do now supply 90% of clothing and, and uh, footwear and machined parts and things that require manufacturing, but the things that require technology uh, and very sophisticated equipment, they don't export very much of that, they import that. And so the idea was they want to try to be able to export these more uh, high demand, high dollar items. And so they have a policy in place to try to develop that. Part of the issue with the rest of the world in the United States is the United States sees this as threatening, uh, this idea, because they've made a statement, they China, that they want to uh, take over each one of these ideas from, not take over, but be competitive to export in every one of these areas. And then it turns out the United States is pretty dominant in each one of these areas. And so when they enter these markets, they become a very difficult competitor and therefore a quote threat. 
A uh, lot of talk in the media over the last year or so about the, a trade war or developing a trade war uh, and what's happening in that regard. And probably the biggest um, area where you see uh, a lot of uh, uh, verbiage uh, bantered about is in the trade deficit. And uh, this is another area where you could probably do a one hour talk on trade deficits and, and uh, get into some economic experts' opinions on whether trade deficits are good or bad or neutral or what are the impacts of trade defi deficits and why do they even exist. Uh, the trouble is from a, a uh, strategic perspective is when you show charts like this, and, and of course the, in this chart, the red is the amount of money that uh, US imports from China, goods in dollars that we import from China, and in blue is the amount that we send back. And this goes back to the previous slide, the 2025, because the things we are exporting to China are uh, tractors and airplanes and radar equipment and aircraft control equipment and uh, things, huge dollar value items per, per individual item. The in things we're importing are shoes and socks and clothing. And so uh, this leads, comes from this uh, economic principle on the slide there of comparative advantage. We have the comparative advantage in high dollar, high tech, high volume items, because over the years we have developed the infrastructure to be able to support that. And we have a wealthy enough economy that, that we can afford to buy that. The difficulty with China is that they have a lot of money uh, as a country, but not a lot of money individually as people. And so you see this here uh, uh, shown in red, uh, many of those things are consumer goods for individual people in the United States. And we have the money to buy and spend that. The trouble is the things that we want to export, that we have the comparative advantage on, there's a limited market in China and elsewhere. We have to do our trading with people who have a high comparative advantage with us in that arena and can afford to buy those products. Uh, it's, it's economically impossible to force people to buy things they can't, don't have the money to or can't afford to buy. And that's the dilemma of this trade uh, imbalance here in the comparative advantage. The other thing uh, shown there in yellow is low skill, low wage versus high skill, high wage. And the low skill, low wage are the manufacturers and clothing manufacturers and things in China. And even now, those things are moving. If you remember back in the, uh, the factory slides, there is an economic principle called the flight of capital, which means that capital investments and factories tend to flow to the area of lowest wages. And that's, that principle has been in, in effect ever, since ever. And even now in China, since the time I was there, where there was a huge amount of economic development in the coastlines, in Shanghai and in Hainan, uh, areas like that, in China now, these factories are moving further and further and further inland where the people will work for less money because there's now a middle class developed uh, in the coastal areas and they're no longer competitive for these low dollar jobs that uh, the factory uh, owners want to pack. And so uh, they're also now losing, they, China, are losing uh, a really high amount of low skilled market share to Vietnam, Malaysia, Indonesia, and particularly India, uh, because they have, uh, India has a huge number of people 
and low, low, low wages, much lower than China. And so the new factories and things now are starting to move from China to India. And so this is, uh, this is what's happening in the trade imbalance. Uh, however you see it in the news here, every time that you get an economic discussion about China, they talk, talk about the trade deficits and how we can make them go away. And the short answer to that is not happening. Uh, and so uh, it's uh, something that, that you'll continue to see it uh, over and over again. The, uh, there is a perception, and it's mostly true, unfair trade practices. This is dumping and subsidized labor. So, for instance, uh, we talked about Baojiang Steel and their, uh, you know, their sub-quality steel. So if that steel is usable for anything, they will virtually give it away uh, just to uh, get rid of it and keep that factory uh, open and available to produce steel. And so this is seen often as dumping where they are, uh, because of their support of this inefficient factory, uh, they are putting uh, products or, uh, in this case, the steel on the market at a much lower than market price, even lower than what it costs them to make it. And so this is dumping. Uh, intellectual property theft has been an issue with China as long as anyone can remember. Uh, still a problem, uh, and it's just something that the battle is going to go on and on uh, about how to preserve uh, intellectual property. And it's a, it's a difficult problem for uh, companies that want to do business in China because, uh, you know, the, the market in China is expanding rapidly as their middle class expands. Uh, businesses do not want to be uh, walled out of going to China to operate, but they also can't afford to lose their intellectual property. So it's a dilemma and a difficult uh, time to try to uh, for companies to find a way to successfully operate inside China. Uh, what happened in the most recent trade war things is because of these perceptions, because of that previous slide on the trade imbalances, uh, the US, uh, particularly President Trump, started to impose tariffs. And uh, this is, uh, they were uh, uh, aimed to try to encourage uh, U.S. consumers to buy American-made products by making foreign products more expensive. And so here you see a chart that shows how those uh, tariffs kind of ratcheted up uh, over the course of this trade war, if you want to call it that, to where there's uh, a, a huge amount of, of tariffing uh, involved on both sides. Uh, and some of the uh, outcomes of this are not as they intended. It's kind of the law of unintended consequences. Uh, one of the things that's not well understood, but uh, you know, it, it seems like when you impose tariffs on uh, Chinese goods that you're punishing the Chinese manufacturer and the Chinese uh, agencies and factories, but you're really not. You're punishing the importer because they're the ones that pay the tariffs. And so uh, that's been kind of a, a fallacy of the fact that uh, we have a, oh, this inflow of a huge amount of money because of these tariffs uh, coming from China, but we really don't. It's coming from us. Uh, it's our own companies and our own uh, agencies putting, paying this tariff in order to be able to import the goods and services. Uh, and again, in red, the, the numbers are lower because our export numbers are lower. And so it's essentially proportional uh, uh, throughout the board there because we just don't export nearly as high a dollar amount in. But the people that have really suffered in that regard, and this is part of the unintended consequences, uh, are U.S. farmers uh, because China puts uh, tariffs on U.S. farm goods and uh, suddenly uh, Brazil starts filling in uh, with the soybean markets and the corn and, and we may never get those 
we may never get those markets back, but that's one of the things what didn't wasn't really foreseen uh, when you get into these dueling tariff uh, scenarios. And it all comes down to the, uh, and this is another one where you could have another one hour talk uh, about the, the, the globalism versus protectionism and is globalism bad in and of its own right and protectionism bad in and of its own right? And, and neither one of those is probably true. There's, there's pluses and minuses uh, to both of them. Uh, but you see, depending on political leaning and, uh, and the order of the day, you'll see either globalism uh, demonized or protectionism uh, demonized. And neither one is really the case. Uh, however, uh, it, and this is my opinion on the economic reading that I've done and what I have managed to learn is that globalism is here to stay. Um, it's, it's just the, there's no way to avoid the interactions that are going on out there because of the different comparative advantages of, of various places around the world. We have to learn to to live within that global system. Uh, so it's going to be interesting to see how that sorts out. This particular company, Huawei, uh, has been on the front lines of the of the trade for war battles here recently. They are a technology company. Their forte is cell phones. Uh, they sell more cell phones in the world than anybody. Uh, one of the detriments they have, if you've been watching the news recently, is their ability indigenously to produce the world's uh, highest quality chips is not there yet. They're still about a whole generation behind uh, in their ability to, to produce their own chips. And so they rely uh, on U.S. facilities and, and particularly on a, on a major company in Taiwan uh, to get the chips for their cell, cell phones and other equipment. There is a huge U.S. push now to try to ban Huawei from participating in communication projects in, in uh, the U.S. or in any of the countries that are allies. And then the most recent action has been try to ban shipping any chips to them uh, that were made using any U.S. materials or technology. And so that's, uh, that's on the front burner right now is the battle with Huawei. And uh, that will be an interesting thing to see how that uh, sorts out because in Asia, uh, Russia, Africa, uh, Huawei is 90% of the market share of cell phones there. So uh, it'll be interesting to see what kind of impact that has uh, across the world on the perceptions of, of China. Uh, right now, another thing that we're seeing that's ratcheted up uh, all of this talk about China is uh, the pandemic and the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and how we've transitioned uh, from the pandemic to politics. And China is now the, the focus of uh, the blame game as far as, as uh, this whole pandemic and the, and the explosion of the virus. And, and so this particular uh, portion of interaction between the company, countries is now driving the train and forcing uh, interactions or uh, changes in uh, our, our relationship with China and other areas because of the pandemic and because of, uh, I, I would say, the, the media play on, uh, on this uh, whole turning towards China uh, for the blame for this. Uh, this was a cartoon that was uh, in the paper just uh, oh, seven or eight days ago now. And uh, it's amazing to me now when you look on, uh, you're on television, you walk the things is that no matter which party, which candidate, which thing, there's always a reference 
to China uh, in the in the uh, campaign literature and the campaign uh, advertisements now, uh, everyone is uh, taking aim at China uh, as a way to deflect attention, I think, uh, from other things. And probably the scariest uh, part of the, of the whole thing when we get to this point is, is there enough animosity now because of the trade war and the, the coronavirus pandemic and now suddenly all of the, the uh, media coverage and the pr political uh, coverage, could it generate into, and we've never had this with China, an actual cold war where we do not interact with them they do become 100% of an enemy, and uh, the whole relationship with them and the rest of the world changes because of that, and we're kind of on the brink of that now. We're not there, but it would be a logical potential next step uh, with the developments that have come, uh, in, come to pass in the last year uh, because of the economic and now the pandemic uh, expansion. So this is our next thing is what happens? Uh, is there a Cold War? And uh, how would that really then impact us uh, throughout? And again, that's another one hour thing. So I'm going to stop right there, Ron, uh, with the thing. And so if, uh, if we want to take some questions, we can do that. I'm going to go back to the China thing. Okay, remember to uh, unmute your microphone, just press the space bar and uh, raise a question. Rocky? <clears throat> Rocky, it's Pam. Yeah, hi, Pam. Hi. Um, that was really interesting, and I learned a lot from it. Um, did you already at some point do a presentation about um, your travels in China? I, I haven't ever done one about travels in China. I mean, I could, but I haven't ever yeah. done one. Okay, well, that I've just wondered if I missed it or something. That would be interesting to me also. And this was very interesting. Thank you for presenting it. Yeah, this is more a political, you know, sure. current affairs thing. And then uh, China's yeah. an amazing place to visit. I would imagine. My mother's been there, but never me. <laughs> Rocky, on that, uh, you mentioned early on that the attention they pay to the study of history. Yes. Does, does that include studying that flirtation with democracy in the teens and, and whatnot? Or? Oh, yes. It's, it, it's in there. Uh, but... <clears throat> I, I would say uh, it gets the equivalent attention to the time span it was in existence. Yeah, <laughs> and I suppose it gives the it, you know what it's I'm a slant to the presenter too. So. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean they're they're slanting. You know, there was a I think it was you know it was Barr the, the attorney general who said the other day, you know, history belongs to the victors. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's, but that's true, particularly in China, because the history is always written when the events are over. And so the people that are in charge when the events are over get to decide what goes into that history. Uh, and so that's what you find in the United States and in China and every other place in the world is that the history, histories were in fact written by the victors. And, and if you don't live in those countries, you don't know how, what their internal vision of themselves is. And that's the difficult, that's what we don't, we really, we really have a, a hard time empathizing with, with anybody from anywhere else in the world. Yeah. Rocky, when you were there in the 90s, did you use your Mandarin a lot or did a lot of people speak English? Nobody spoke English. The, oh, interesting. Yeah, they were, 
they were learning in the in the schools and they would love to try to get you to talk and do things in beijing you could find in the there were uh stores and that catered to foreigners and uh, like three of them and if you went to those stores then there were people there that would speak english on the street in beijing hardly unless you ran into a student who wanted to practice nobody spoke english if you went to any of these other outlying countries uh, countries cities nobody spoke english and so now to me it was it was a lot of fun at that time because i was in places where i was the first white person they'd ever seen oh my goodness huh. and uh so, so when, it's, uh, when you when you went to the outlying cities and you spoke some mandarin and they didn't speak or understand mandarin did you have to have a um interpreter with you if you were going to do official business then yes you would have to have an interpreter in most of those places it, now you, you have to realize as far as the mandarin goes it's been taught in chinese schools since 1950. so mm -hmm. all the children are learning mandarin when they grow when when they've grown up so the people you know i was born in 48 so the the people that are my age learned uh mandarin growing up and they but they also learned their local language and business and commerce is still conducted in the local language not in mandarin the hmm. local business and then if you're dealing nationally then it's in mandarin the, the other thing you can do, and this is, was hard for me because I did not learn how to write very well uh, because it's really difficult. Uh, but I knew maybe 50 characters that I could write easily. And so if you really get in a pine, the characters are the same and they mean the same things. They're just pronounced differently. And so yeah. if you can write the characters down, the people will understand what you want right away. And did you speak Mandarin and understand it well enough that you were functional and fluent? Uh, I would not say fluent. I only had one year, and that's not enough. To, okay. If yeah. if I was gonna, I was. Uh, I would say I was probably at an eighth grade level. Wow. Oh. And so, if you were, if you were, if I was gonna have a technical discussion or or you know, any kind of a higher level discussion, I couldn't do it. Uh, Brian, Rocky? Go ahead. Could you uh, talk a little bit about uh, the filial piety uh, issue? I guess my experience has been that uh, there still is a huge uh, appreciation for family, but certainly as the cities grow bigger and the kids uh, uh, change, uh, there is a somewhat of a breakdown. But uh, if uh, in your mind that that is breaking down, then talk a little bit about the replacement. Okay, the, and I, it is break. In my opinion, it, it is breaking down. The, the uh, once the uh, once the individuals were actually allowed to move from their home or their their birth area, uh, to that changed everything. Uh, and they were people in China before, at that time in the in the fifties and sixties were all everybody was employed in one of these donways in one of these trade unions or industries, and so everything you got your housing your thing was all through them, and and you would get your housing your house and keep it. So if you're if you had parents or grandparents, they were in your house, uh, and then they stayed with you. And your family, your core family, they had large core families. Extended families always lived together. Uh, we don't have any real concept of that anymore. It, it was that way for us back many, many, many years ago. But uh, it, for them, that lasted into the not too distant past. Uh, then when they started allowing movement, that started the breakdown in filial piety. 
and and the difficulty was there was no now they are they are starting to get now nursing homes assisted living facilities uh, and the reason they're starting to get those is that's a capitalist venture uh, and so you can now open as a money-making uh, idea uh, a nursing home and it'll fill up right away uh, and so there is now a transition uh, from the solely from the the family from the filial piety now they still respect the family and the historical family that hasn't gone away at all it's it's only the physical care part of it that has actually diminished and started to go away but as far as revering your parents revering your grandparents revering your ancestors that's gone it, it, i mean they have teenager rebellion just like anybody else does uh, but their concept of family is still much much stronger uh, in that regard, but there is a strong development. The other thing they don't have in China is anything that remotely resembles social security. And so the, for elderly people and family, they were all taken care of by their family and they stayed in the Donway and your house and your retirement and was provided by the Donway. But once you leave the Donway now, and you're in this capitalist scenario there is no central government retirement system at all oh. so Rocky, that has excuse me for interrupting but that has started uh in china uh and there is a it's a small system and certainly nothing like ours but uh they have started something comparable to the social security system but yeah. could you speak a little bit more about the middle class and the whole growth of of the middle class yeah it's been dynamic the the uh of course once again it's the law of large numbers and when you're talking about china i mean it's really difficult when you talk in percentages and real numbers and and uh, all of those things but the but there is without a doubt now a middle class developing in china and and you see private schools that were for, there were private schools for the super, super rich. But once again, all of these, uh, uh, everything like private schools, like healthcare uh, for seniors, daycare for that, you did never have daycare, your grandparents took care of them. Now there are daycare centers opening. Uh, all of those are a product of the capitalism and the diffusion of the work and the ability to move. And, and so all of those things have led to uh, development of a middle class and development of middle class shopping and middle class facilities. And there's, that's, you know, they have uh, probably a more harshly divided uh, cutoff between the poor, the middle class and the upper class than you see. Uh, in other places, uh, but that's smoothing out too. The, the people that are still in, in deep trouble are, are the farmers and the people in the rural areas. Uh, none of this, there, are, there is no middle class in the rural areas. Uh, that's the, the middle class concept applies to the cities. Uh, the rural areas are still dirt poor and without much, uh, without much outlook of that changing. Uh, but China's a totally different place now than when I was there. Have you been back there since 1997? Just once. Yeah, I don't want to go back. I mean, I do want to go back, but I don't want to go back. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I'm really, I'm really, I want to go back to see what it's like and what's changed. But I don't want to go be back and see what's changed. The so many of the things and places I saw and things were what I would call classic China, and and that's now being overcome by the the uh, capitalist development and and all of the modernization and things. Those there used to be all kind of what they call hutongs, which means alleys, the the single story residences and were gorgeous old places where families lived, and those are almost all gone now. 
been torn down so they can put up high rise housing and, and put 10,000 people in the same footprint. So uh, there's only one time for a couple days, Pam. Hey, Rocky, what do you, uh, do you have any comments on what the client states in the South China Sea think about that expansion? I would say, like always, uh, there are there of two minds. Uh, they, everybody who gets the support wants the support, uh, and so they're they're trying to walk a path uh, where they can get the support and not be uh, fused to China. Uh, and it's going to be more effective for China in some places than others, but. The, the attitude toward China is much different than we think people's attitude toward China is. Uh, many of the small countries, the small islands, where they have only one major port, and now they have a brand new major port, they're, they don't have a bad thing to say about China. Uh, you know, when we were in the, one of the island countries and they have the, they have a brand new 50,000 person soccer stadium built by the Chinese. Well, guess what kind of feedback they get every time, you know, every time they go to a soccer game or a football game, the, they get, they, China gets good press. So it's, it's two edged. They're, they're really skeptical and they, and I think in a lot of ways they have an idea what the intent is, but they can't force themselves to turn down the money. So they're trying to walk a path. And whether they'll be successful or not remains to be seen. Rocky, on those uh, trade deficit charts, when you have a product that's, uh, you know, maybe developed here, assembled part there, something added back here, is that all taken into account when we try to check the numbers and you know is it a is a value added thing or is it a is it a, an accumulated value that's being tracked as we go along i i don't think they keep very good track of added value right okay. uh, it's it's like all of these things you know we're showing our my my presentation has one chart in there which you can break that down into 50 other charts and the, each one of those down into 50 other charts uh, until you get down to you know, individual items. Uh -huh. uh, it's really hard to, to track. And that's the whole, you know, when we talk about globalism and protectionism is just what you described is, is kind of what life is like now on the planet. Uh, you know, you have a washer built here and a nut built here and, and the whole housing facility is built somewhere else, and then they all come together in one place and, and turn into a car. Yeah. And we're, and we're all enjoying those products. <laughs> yeah, and that's the, that's the dilemma of the whole idea of trade uh, deficits and things. The, the reason you have trade deficits is they, they are not mandated by anyone. You know, you have those trade deficits because that's what people wanted and that's what businesses wanted. No one forced them to do that. All of those decisions were made uh, either economically for, from a profit uh, perspective or, or from a, a, a essential perspective and that I want that and I want it to look like this when it's done and I'm willing to pay for it. Uh, and so you get into those uh, trade deficit numbers because that's what people wanted. And so that's why I say, you know, when you try to make that go away by edict, in other words, by, you know, by passing a law or something that says you can't do that, that's really hard to do. Okay, well, very good presentation, and uh, thank you. Any other questions out there? Uh, yeah. Are U.S. citizens uh, 
then we were able to tour throughout China with some hospitality. Could you say that again? The first part broke up for me. Oh, oh I'm sorry. I'm just wondering if U.S. citizens are able to travel comfortably throughout China. If U.S. citizens are what? If you're, your mic's breaking up on me, Denny. Can anybody else relay, relay that for me? I, I couldn't catch it. No, oh, guess not. Can you say that again, Dennis? Well, I was just curious if U.S. citizens are able to comfortably travel throughout China. Oh, yes. Uh, sorry, I, I didn't understand that the first Oh, yeah, absolutely. That when I was there, of course, it was totally different because no one spoke English. When they went through the ramp up to get prepared for the Olympics, English became mandatory everywhere. And they taught millions of people how to speak English. When I went, when I lived there, there was one travel agency in China, and it was owned by the Chinese government. Uh, and it was hard to try to travel in China. Now there are literally thousands of reputable travel agencies in China. And so my my opinion is absolutely, it's a safe and easy to uh, travel in China, and, and they are more than willing to take your money. Thank you. Any sense of uh, what the crime statistics would be like for China? It's changing somewhat, I think. Again, my opinion, Ron. When I was there, uh, uh, well, for one thing, and I'm not sure about that now, I haven't looked at statistics in a long time. We used to get briefings about all these things all the time. We kept track of it as an embassy. The uh, violent crime in China just about does not exist, uh, one of the, except for mentally impaired people, uh, because there's no way to stop that. But uh, the other thing is, is, is uh, inside China, there are, very harsh on any kind of a violent crime or a crime committed with a weapon. Uh, if you commit a crime with a weapon, essentially they kill you, so you don't ever have to worry about doing that crime again. Uh, when we lived in Beijing, you could go anywhere in that city anytime, day or night, as a woman alone and never fear for anything. And and that's pretty amazing. Now, I don't think it's that way now. I think that's changed uh, to a certain degree. But back then, and that was true everywhere I went, every city I went. You were never, ever felt any danger from anything. Uh, but I think that that's somewhat, is somewhat changed now. Does that answer your question, Ron? Yes, thank you. I think that's a wrap. Okay. <laughs> okay. Not too bad. I didn't run over too much. No. Thank you all for attending and uh, some pretty good questions out there and a good presentation. So. All right. Thanks, guys. Take, take care. See ya. Take